Welcome to the Happy Dog, Happy Human podcast, where we explore the intersection between human mental health and our relationships with dogs. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Hi, I'm Sharon. I am a human dog bond facilitator and therapeutic interaction strategist. I am the founder of Human Canine Collaborative, through which I support humans and dogs through trauma recovery, grief journeying, and professional practices of trauma-informed care by cultivating skills for somatic consent and nervous system regulation. I am also a licensed occupational therapist in California and hold a doctorate in occupational therapy with advanced clinical practice in community-based mental health. I have over 15 years experience working as a certified professional dog trainer and canine behavior consultant, specializing in public safety and dog bite prevention, animal assisted activities with special populations and rehabilitation for anxious, reactive and traumatized dogs. Hi, I'm Angela, the CEO of Cloud Doodles. We are a company that raises awareness about the benefits of dogs on mental health. We sell meaningful dog and human accessories to support our platform and to be able to give 25% of our profits to animal, dog, and mental health related charities. All of our patterns have a special mental health meaning and are designed and hand drawn by me. I believe that every human and dog should be privy to the unconditional love they provide for each other. I hold a BA in studio arts and a master's of social work. I am a licensed clinical social worker in the state of California, where I specialized in homelessness and severe mental illness. I currently reside in Italy with my poodle mix duchess, my husband, and toddler. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Happy Dog, Happy Human podcast. This is Sharon. And this is Angela, and this is a very exciting episode because it is the last episode of our season one, which is amazing. And I want to take a moment to just congratulate Sharon and I, uh, because it took a lot of work and a lot of dedication. And um, I feel that we made a body of work that is honest and authentic and true to our values. And I hope everyone who followed along with us and continues to follow with us um, got something out of it. Mm, thanks for saying that. Yeah, it's so important to um, celebrate, you know, your accomplishments and our accomplishments. And uh, thank you for making space for that, Angela. Absolutely. Um, so like our previous episodes, we are going to start with updates today, uh, Mm -hmm. before we get into our topic, but, uh, I will intro our topic quickly. We will be talking about, um, dog psychosis today as a part two to last week's episode on, uh, human psychosis. Mm -hmm. Um, so before we do that, in terms of cloud doodle updates, we have our spring bundles, um, up on our website, uh, with our secret dog den pattern and our monthly newsletter is going out, um, at the beginning of every month, we are recording this on the 31st, but please sign up on, um, on, uh, our website for to receive those monthly newsletters and I think that's really it I'm I'm blanking a little bit on all of our updates but we have some um, just follow along our Instagram and everything is there um, and I definitely want to do a plug-in for the happy dog uh, happy human um, subscription and care tip library that is for 99 a month um, and we will have all of those fully updated and during our break in between the two seasons, we will have some more um, afterthought episodes that will come up here and there. And um, we will let you know how long the break between the two is, between our two seasons um, on our Instagram. If you, uh, so be sure to follow us at, at happy dog underscore happy human. Awesome. Thanks for plugging us and yeah, go to at cloud doodles and get your spring bundles. I love that um, secret dog den pattern. It's very cool. So Thank you. Um, 
yeah. for my updates for Human Canine Collaborative. Um, I'm not going to plug anything new, but I want, I've been working on be, becoming more clear for myself and for my clients on what co-regulation coaching is and who it's for, like looking for a specific type of person, not just anyone with a dog or uh, who is struggling with their dog's behavior, but someone who's really interested in engaging in the type of work that I'm providing. So my, so co-regulation is really, it's a 50% like addressing the dog's behavior and um, dealing with dogs who are reactive or anxious or uh, like hyperactive, overexcited, or who are struggling with aggression, like growling excessively or lunging and reacting on leash or biting. Um, so that's 50% of the focus is on helping the dog and building the dog's skills and helping the human to understand their dog's communication better. And the other 50% of the service is helping, supporting the person to become more aware of themselves and how their nervous system shifts and fluctuates throughout the day, helping them understand um, what they need by developing a practice of listening to their own body so that they know what they need, what their boundaries are, um, and developing skills in communication, like asking for support, setting boundaries, um, and communicating more clearly to your dog. So I'm really looking for people who are interested in both of those components. And I offer a free 30-minute affinity call to help us learn if, if we're a good fit, like if I'm a good fit for you and if you're a good fit for this type of work. And so in that affinity call, I want to know about your goals and your expectations for a program like this. I want to give you space to ask me questions about my perspective on dog and human relationships and my approach and the methods that I use. And we're and we might determine in that session whether we're a good fit. Um, but sometimes I really notice that I benefit from like processing something overnight and then like discovering, you know, over the next few days. So I might not always know uh, in that session. And I want to give you time to think about it as well, because I really want us to both be fully invested in working together. And, and if we're not a good fit, I, I don't want to take your money and have you feel like you're not getting what you want out of the program. So if you're curious, go to hc-collab.com and you can check out my coaching page. And then if you want, you can hop on a free affinity call and we can talk it over. Thanks for clarifying that, Sharon. I think when I think about your program, I really think about it's the person, a person who really values personal development and wanting to take their self-reflection and reflection with their dog to the next level. Mm, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Cool. All right. So shall we move into our care tip? Yes, please. Okay. So this, our, well, my final care tip of this season is, um, I'm going to call it the golden bubble, thought bubble, and we're going to just jump right into it. It's a mindfulness practice. So let's get comfy and close our eyes when you feel comfortable. And let's take one deep breath in through the nose, out through the nose. And as you settle into place, into the present moment, let your mind wander, let your thoughts come in and let them flow. Let them go in one side and out the other, just like a movie reel. If you find yourself getting stuck on a thought, let that thought sit in your mind and without judgment, without criticism, allow the thought to play. And as it's playing, 
We want to envision that it's being enveloped in a golden bubble, like a soap bubble. And as the soap bubble is wrapping it up, the thought becomes farther away in between you and the golden soapy film of the bubble. And we're going to watch the bubble rise as soapy bubbles all do. And the thought gets further and further away as the bubble keeps rising and rising up into the sky where you can no longer see it. And now we're going to return to our thoughts in this present moment and allow them to go in one side, out the other. And if we get stuck on another thought, we're going to repeat the bubble practice we just did. And I'm going to count us out of this now. Um, three, two, one. Open your eyes when you're ready. Hello. Hello. I was imagining myself blowing bubbles, like I was blowing my thoughts oh. into the bubble. I like that. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Another way you can also do like a balloon, yeah. um, just something or cloud, mm -hmm. whatever you like that feels kind of fuzzy or round, soft. That's kind of the vibe we're going for. Yeah. Floating. <laughs> yeah. Something not menacing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It seems like it's like, it was important to have something to visualize in the mind and to also like instead of being in the thought and like consumed by the thought and having feeling like the thoughts are just coming and I'm like at the mercy of them to like step aside and be like oh there's the thought over there but the thought is yeah not, like, surrounding me yeah you like you don't have to be like you said you don't have to be consumed by it mm -hmm. and it's it you know sometimes we get stuck on thoughts and or images also like I want to say I think a lot of times we only think of well thoughts and images they they go together mm -hmm. um and it's difficult to get them out of our mind so this is really just a way to um practice mindfully to let allow that thought to let it go in a way that is non-judgmental or yeah. not you know, pushing it out in a way that you're maybe criticizing yourself saying, why are you thinking that, you know, you're so yeah. dumb or whatever mm -hmm. sort of like negative self-talk might come up. So this is just an alternative, um, a healthier alternative for your mind <laughs> and mm -hmm. your self-esteem to yeah. um, maybe let thoughts go that disturb you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it takes practice. It's not an easy thing to do. So if you had trouble with doing that today, um, be kind to yourself. I would say Absolutely. like, try to just be grateful that you tried it. You know, that's the most important thing is you just tried it and it might take a hundred more times of trying it before you really feel like, Oh, I'm experiencing this like observation place instead of being consumed by the thought. Yeah, it takes, a, I mean, mindfulness is a practice and it takes a lot of practice to be able to do it. And especially when there's high stress situations. I mean, that's why I always recommend practicing mindfulness when you're not stressed out, um, because then it becomes much more difficult to do these, mm -hmm. these practices. And of course we all have our days where, you know, it's just not working and that's okay. Also mm -hmm. like what Sharon is saying. Okay. Yeah. So Sharon, let's dive into this topic about dog psychosis. I'm so curious about it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to 
hear more um, about how dogs may experience psychosis. Mm -hmm. Um, I think maybe before we talk about it, I, I would like to clarify or discuss um, something about the difference between schizophrenia and psychosis. And this just yeah. goes in general for humans. So I'd like to preface that. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of times when we think psychosis, we think schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And schizophrenia is a DSM diagnosis, mm -hmm. uh, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. And you have to have certain criteria for a certain amount of time in order to be diagnosed with schizophrenia by a, a medical or mental health professional. Um, and that is a label that's used uh, within those systems to help someone. Um, you know, uh, so I just want to put that out there because sometimes these words get put into layman, into sort of popular culture or just like regular speaking terms mm -hmm. um and it's misused mm. um and psychosis what that really means is is it can be a symptom it's kind of a blank it's an umbrella term mm. um and can be a symptom of psychosis I think of, of well excuse me schizophrenia so I really think of it as a more of a symptom mm -hmm. um and a lot of different things can fall under it also yeah I don't know if you have uh, Sharon, if you want to expand on that. Mm, yeah. Well, in terms of humans or in terms of dogs, like symptoms? Well, just the word, the word psychosis, like if there's more to it yeah. when you think of that word. Well, it really is an umbrella term. You know, it's not a specific symptom or a specific type of symptom. It's like a collection of symptoms. Um, and it's interesting when I, when I looked through the, um, veterinary medical and like animal related animal behavior literature I see the word psychosis and then and sometimes it's used as an umbrella term for behavior problem in huh. animals right so it's like I'm looking at this article like oh this is about psychosis in I found this one article that looked at three different groups of dogs um one group was in like a single dog in a family home and another group were shelter dogs in a shelter and another group were working dogs on farms and they were looking to see where there are differences in psychosis mm -hmm. and they're using that word, but they were defining psychosis as like aggression or abnormal vocalizing or excessive licking, um, repetitive pacing, tail chasing and circling. So like these are um, abnormal behaviors or could be problematic, but not necessarily psychosis, at like, like we're using that word for human mental health. So I just thought that was really interesting. Yeah, it is absolutely very interesting. And I think we've talked about that throughout this entire season with different wor words, how people use them differently. And um, because we have sort of structured this season with the mental health diagnoses from the DSM. Mm -hmm. um, we have been also thinking about them kind of in that, in, in that criteria and in that zone, but people take those words and use them differently yeah. in their life and media takes it differently and researchers use it differently. Yeah. Um, so, so I think when we're talking about psychosis, you know, I'm really thinking about, like you said, it is an umbrella term for symptoms. And I'm thinking about symptoms that are like a break in reality mm. or a disorganization of reality. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. that can mean a lot of different things. It could be a disorganization of your senses. It could be a disorganization of your thinking. It could be a disorganization of your behavior in general. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's sort of how I I uh, have been putting it in that framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, like, psychosis is a it's a, an umbrella term for symptoms, but certain types of symptoms that have to do with specifically with disorganization of the sensory experience or the yeah. thought experience or the reality. Yeah. Like exactly and then under that you could put like let's take the thought one for example if you do a disorganization of thought then we're 
thinking like paranoia could go under that, Mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. And I say that one because a lot of times we label, um, we use the label paranoid schizophrenic. You hear that like, you know, left, right and center. And that's, that's a, like paranoia is a symptom of the disorganization of thought. So Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it's more complex. And I understand when we're talking to each other in these sort of more casual settings, um, we don't dive into the detail as much, but I think it's important for us to distinguish that. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think it's important is because if we're talking about animals experiencing psychosis and comparing it to human beings, like what, what are we comparing also? Right. Yeah. I think we need to be specific when we're having that type of conversation. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So yeah, can dogs experience psychosis? <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the extra, extra sensory experiences, um, there are, there, there is evidence that dogs appear to be behaving in ways as though they're they're reacting to something that they see that we don't see. And there's two specific um, ways this looks. One is called fly catching syndrome or fly biting syndrome, where it appears like the dog is trying to bite flies that are like around their head and they're doing this excessively and it's like disrupting their engagement in regular activities. Like it's, it's disruptive enough that someone seeks out like veterinary help or behavior help with mm. this syndrome. And then the other one is referred to as like stargazing behavior or staring at nothing kind of behavior where the dog is appearing to like look up or stare at something that you don't see or like that, um, that we might, that we can't tell what it is. It doesn't seem like they're looking at anything or, or anything specific. Interesting. Yeah. And, um, well, funny, the fly catching, was it? it was yeah. Fly catching. Mm-hmm. That one, <laughs> I definitely like think sometimes like puppies <laughs> do that, but that's definitely yeah. not excessive. Like they're just kind of biting at the air. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I think about that, of course, times 10 and it being disruptive to their behavior. Mm-hmm. And um, the stargazing also almost sounds catatonic, which is interesting yeah. because that's something you see that is part of the um, criteria. One of the criteria is for like a schizophrenic diagnosis, for example, in humans. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And catatonia is like a, it's almost like a paralysis or like a lack of interaction with the environment and kind of like, um, even like holding specific positions, I'm thinking like I've heard that or have read about um, you could like someone who's in catatonia, you could lift their arm up and it would just like stay up there. Like they're not interacting mm. with you or the environment. They're just kind of like um, awake, but not present. That's a really good description of catatonia. Um But it's interesting because then, you know, we always want, I mean, I'm always curious, like, what is the source of that, right? What are the source of these behaviors? So, Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Of course, we're never going to have the exact answer for that. But I imagine like catatonia, for example, or the stargazing, could that be associated also with maybe a dog's uh, getting older Mm -hmm. and maybe losing their brain functioning because they're getting older right yeah Yeah, certainly with canine dementia there can be um disorganization or like a confusion I've heard people describe their dogs as seeming like they're confused or or behaving aggressively when they weren't before right absolutely and um also I was just thinking well, right. And so then, but does it also matter? Like if, what, what is it? Well, I guess it does for the purposes of the, of this podcast. And we're talking about dog psychosis, like a lot of these symptoms, when I was also looking into it, they do overlap with other potential mm-hmm. mental health symptoms. So one of the things that I saw is maybe um, like excessive mood changes in um, a dog so that they'll go from being like extremely happy and playful to being suddenly extremely aggressive with no 
apparent um, stimulus or reason for that happening. And then it just like flips back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, But I guess that also could be, I mean, I'm thinking that could be bipolar, maybe. (laughs) It's possible. Normal too. Or it could be normal, right? Because I think like we miss a lot of things, Mm. right? Like Mm -hmm. yesterday, um, Muggins and I, I was, Muggins and I were at a neighbor's house and the dogs were playing together and um toward like after like 10 minutes or so they were kind of like doing their own thing for a little while they were taking a break and then muggins went over to the other dog and started like sniffing around the dog's mouth and then started to like lick like almost the inside of the dog's mouth and the dog i saw the dog for a split second he raised his lips like showed his teeth Mm. muggins didn't see or respond to that and then the dog snapped at muggins right and then the the other dog's owner was like see he sometimes just does this out of the blue and i was like nope it was not out of the blue at all that dog didn't like muggins licking the inside of his mouth (laughs) told this to muggins and muggins didn't respond at least not quickly enough so the dog was setting a boundary maybe it was a little like excessive in the way the dog set the boundary you know like they were more mean than like maybe was necessary but maybe not because muggins didn't see the first boundary (laughs) you know so the and the dog was tired by that point and who knows what else the dog did throughout that day I think the owner had said they had been to the park you know so the dog was tired and um didn't want muggins slick in his mouth you know so that was a reasonable to me that was a reasonable uh boundary setting yeah I mean I think that's that's the hardest thing about observing um Mm -hmm. and then trying to make get information out of the observation because yeah, we don't, we don't know. We don't know what led up to like this quote unquote snapping or like mood shift. Um, yeah. It's hard to know if it's because of something internal or something external. Right. Yeah. So, so you have to look at all the pieces, not just like that one moment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think like, I mean, I'm assuming that the actual psychosis like the psychotic symptoms is probably extremely rare Mm, it's rare-ish yeah depending on the breed so like with fly catching syndrome um it there are it is more prevalent in cavalier king charles spaniels miniature schnauzers and greater swiss mountain dogs so like with breeding um in order to get us a, a dog breed we have to inbreed you know we have to breed mm-hmm. the same dog type of dog together over and over right so so that's why we do have situations in which there are congenital um disorders or or health conditions with a genetic basis because when we breed a dog to like be able to behave a certain way or to look a certain way there are other traits that are going to go along with that um and so with fly catching syndrome if we're like thinking about like, okay, what could be going on where the dog is like seeing something that isn't there or is just like having this excessive movement that doesn't seem to have any function or organization to it. Um, To me, it makes sense that it shows up more in Cavalier King Charles Spaniels because their breeding has been such that, you know how they look like puppies even their whole lives, you know? Mm -hmm. The reason they look like that and the reason we love it so much is because their skull has actually been bred to be too small for their neural structures. So like their eyes are big, big, like big on their skull. And that looks infantile to us. So we all, we have like a genetic response or like a, an innate response to beings who have eyes that are too big for their skull because that's how babies look. Right. So then we have like this nurturing response or this like, Oh, like you're so cute. I want to take care of you response. And so we bred that into Cavalier King Charles. And so what that means is that they don't have enough space in their skull for their brain and their cerebrospinal fluid. And so that puts a lot of pressure on their central nervous system and causes things to happen, like extrasensory experiences potentially, or um, differences in how sensation is experienced. It causes pain uh, and motor disorders. Sometimes um, there was a dog <clears throat> when I lived in LA. I worked with a dog for a long time that was a Cavalier King Charles, and he had this condition. 
And there would be some times where like he would really enjoy being touched or, and he would be fine if you picked him up. And there would be other times where you would pick him up and he would yelp, like, like he Mm. just got stabbed or something. And it was just like, I'm like, you're picking him up in the same way every time. So like what's happening there and what's happening is like his sensory system is like having trouble, you know, it's out of work and is yeah. sending extra messages of like, this is painful, but right. it's inconsistent, you know, and it's, well, it's disorganized. Like what we were yeah. saying at the beginning. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's really interesting. And that also makes me think about like, well, I was reading some things about how it's hard to understand the genetics of, um, if there's like, let's say a, let's use the word schizophrenia gene Mm -hmm. in dogs, um, because there has been a lot, I'm using that word because there's been a lot of research on human schizophrenia, what schizophrenia genes. So -hmm. let's say if we want to compare, um, it would be very difficult to do that because we don't have the, the gene, the gene makeup of the wolves that were bred into what we know as um, the human companion dog today. Mm. And so if that wolf originally had this schizophrenia gene or not, Mm. and usually how evolution works is that if you, let's say have this fly syndrome, I keep, I'm, I keep messing it up. Fly catching. What is it? Fly, catching. fly catching. I don't know why that's so hard. <laughs> okay. Fly catching syndrome. If you, if um, a wolf had fly catching syndrome, they're probably not going to survive because they yeah. would not be able to function or hunt or take care of the pack and the pack would probably move on. Right. Yeah. So a lot of these genes um, evolutionarily get bred get bred out or not bred that's the wrong word but they they get pushed out as the species continues on so it's interesting with dogs because we have manipulated their genes basically and their evolution and so they come with all these hosts of problems that um mental physical whatever that you know human or uh that animals in the wild you may not necessarily see it Mm. there right um and we've done the same to human beings right like i mean for example even like terrible eyesight you would probably not survive if you had terrible eyesight that's actually a yeah i mean it's just that's the way of nature right like it's not not the kindest but we have um almost because of the way our species has developed technologically we're able to um keep genes that wouldn't usually survive in nature without our technologies and our care and dogs have been along for the ride with us in that sense Mm -hmm. so so it is it's just interesting to see like maybe even potential differences of what dogs may experience or have genetically predisposed compared to animals in the wild for example Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's interesting and the way that genes work it's like even with schizophrenia, just because someone has the gene doesn't mean they're going to display those symptoms or their behaviors because it depends on like how, how they interact with their environment and what environment they're in. And a lot of times it's, we see these types of symptoms in stressful environments. It's like associated with like, this is a stressful experience or a stressful condition. And we see the symptoms increase in stressful conditions. Absolutely. And also I just want to say that I don't believe there is no um, like schizophrenia gene per se, but what like they look at things that may be part of a gene that um, expresses itself a certain way in your brain Mm. that then they think is related to schizophrenia. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah, it's really complex. It's it's very complex. And like our understanding of our brain is like, like 0.1 and also of our genes. So um, yeah, yeah, I just want to say that without going too much into it because one, I don't fully understand it and two, nobody else does. But um, like with these types of genes, it's, it's more of like a piece of your, it's a piece of your gene that's expressing something in your brain or body. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they have, they're trying to find like links, I guess, with a lot of mental health problems 
mm-hmm. in those genes and how your brain might create dopamine or mm. some other neurotransmitter or hormones or whatever. Wow. So, um, yeah, so uh, um, basically, uh, what were we talking about? I'm sorry, right before <laughs> I had a thought, oh, I had a good thought, really right we before talking, I started talking about that. What were you saying? <laughs> talking about fly catching syndrome. Oh, and how the symptoms increase around stress. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're not going to edit this out because this yeah, is how this is our brain life. processing goes. This is real <laughs> life. <laughs> I have mom brain <laughs> very badly, right. but I was just so into what I was saying that I forgot <laughs> what else, the other thought that I had. Yep. <laughs> so, no, but I think that's a really important point that you're saying. And we talked about this a little bit last time that, um, like they are finding a lot that, schizophrenia or these blanket term psychotic symptoms can occur because of some severe stress that happens in your environment Mm -hmm. that it's not necessarily related to your genes probably some mix of it right um but it could also be a restructuring of your brain as a young child when Mm -hmm. your brain is developing if you're like under a lot of stress Mm -hmm. your brain might do something to protect it or if you go through some major trauma so Mm -hmm. i'm thinking uh, military dogs that was something also that comes up if they have severe enough um post-traumatic stress coming back they may be exhibiting signs that look like they're experiencing psychosis. Mm, interesting. And they might actually be experiencing it, but it's a direct result of this trauma that they went through. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. So I want to shift back to fly catching syndrome <laughs> okay. and talk about what, what else could be going on um, because it, what I've read about with fly catching syndrome is like it there's there's other symptoms that are there also and and there are de- there are definitely like various um speculated causes and so I found this one study that looked at 24 dogs which was really nice uh to get like a number and looking at all these different dogs that were displaying fly catching syndrome And they also displayed other things. So like um, excessive air licking, which I guess is similar, kind of like licking, licking nothing, (laughs) licking the air, Um, but also excessive um, licking of themselves or the floor um, and like tail chasing or head shaking, um, sucking on their limbs or their hair. And then there also can be Um, seizures could coincide with this behavior and um and then uh eating like eating objects or eating mud or you know like eating things that aren't food necessarily um and then aggressive behavior can co-occur as well and then in this specific study with 24 dogs there was um some like digestive issues going on in some of the dogs and and this was like a variety there were like 14 different breeds of dogs that this was occurring in so so there these suspected causes of this fly catching behavior were um floaters in the eyes you know how if you've ever seen just like yes my husband has that yeah yeah that's yeah that's it's horrible like, Yes, yeah, but yeah. It's, a, it's a condition of the eye, not necessarily yes. of the brain. Right. Um, uh, we talked about Cavalier King Charles, so having illness or or um, differences in structure for the nerves and of motor and sensation. So having those like motor and sensation abnormalities, um, dietary allergies or gastroesophageal reflux disease, and um, and so they were, uh, they looked at these dogs and kind of like looked at all of the other symptoms that they also had. And then they did some medical tests to figure out what's going on inside of the dogs. And so one of the dogs, um, had deafness, which was also interesting. Mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So like sense, I'm always thinking like sensory things. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking the same though. Yeah. Yeah. 
And um, in the Cavalier King Charles that were in the study, they did have uh, Chiari malformation or syringomyelia, which are related to that um, small brain or small mm -hmm. skull, um, regular size brain. Um, and the dogs did also have other abnormalities in their brain structures, like asymmetry in the ventricles, which are like the brain has like all of these folds in it. And then there are these two spaces in the like middle of the brain that are called the ventricles and they hold fluid and they typically are the same size on both sides. But in one of the dogs in this study, they were different sizes, which can obviously produce different experiences. And then one of the dogs had a brain tumor oh. also. Well, to me, this is, I mean, it's interesting to hear this that like so much physical, there's so many physical things, underlying things that can always be a cause of observed behavior. Yeah. Um, I feel like we always circle back to this at the dog when we talk about dogs and yeah. every episode yeah. that it's just so, because they can't talk to us. It's just so important to really like rule out medical things mm -hmm. before. Um, I mean, for humans too, though. Like yeah, it's, it's absolutely. the same. Mm -hmm. There might be this underlying condition that is creating, right. um, that is creating a, an experience of psychosis of basically whatever the symptom is under the umbrella term. It's just a way to cope. Yeah. Or it's a way that like your this underlying problem is expressing itself. Right. Yeah. And you can't uh, treat the problem until you know what's causing it. You know, yes. I mean, sure, sure you yeah. can treat symptoms, but then like if you're not treating the underlying issue, then, you know, you're not really going to help. Right. Absolutely. I yeah. feel bad for the, for the King Charles though, because that's, that's like an issue with the way that we're breeding them. Yeah. And I didn't know that about them. It makes me sad. I really like them. I like them too. They're such a great breed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a hard reality of some of these breeds that we, that we think are adorable but yeah. they have so many issues. Um, I'm thinking French bulldog and pug. Um, <laughs> yeah, those are cuties. Yeah, but that, that's a very interesting study and, and cool that they were able to get like such a big sample and actually really, yeah. it sounds like they really like dug into each individual one also. They did, yeah. Yeah, so it was interesting to think about like, oh, seizure behavior. Seizures look different right. in different beings, right? So we need to rule that out. Um, and then the digestive problems were a pretty big component, which also has, there's a relation with the stargazing or the staring at nothing mm. behavior. Um, so like you were saying, it's so important to rule out medical causes. And this relates to a case that I'm currently working with where the humans um, have been struggling with this dog's eating behavior, but it's created this like like anxious dynamic in their household where the dog won't eat. And then the humans are reacting to that, like worrying about the dog and offering all these different ways of eating. Um, and then uh, um, last spring, they had, they had figured out, like the dog was also having like chronic vomiting and diarrhea. And they had figured out that the dog needed to be on a hydrolyzed protein diet, like the dog wasn't digesting protein um, in the mm -hmm. right way. So they switched the dog's diet and then the vomiting and diarrhea cleared up, but the, the eating behavior is still a problem. So they came to me for support with that, like, cause they wanted to help with their own anxiety about it, but also want yeah. to like help the dog to eat better. And so one of the ways that I evaluate, um, dogs when I work with people is I have them fill out something called the canine behavior and research questionnaire. And this is a standardized assessment that um, was developed at the University of Pennsylvania and um, a famous researcher in the animal behavior world named James Serpell is one of the people who developed this. And so I use this and it asks a whole host of questions in all different categories asks about like separation related behaviors and chasing behaviors and aggression and fear and anxiety, but it asks about staring at nothing. Mm. And so when the, the clients uh, filled that out, they uh, were able to note how frequently the dog shows this and it showed up as a concern. And I would have never asked about that otherwise, but it was on that assessment. And so I asked them about it 
I was like, are you seeing this behavior? And they're like, yeah, every once in a while, the dog just seems to like stare at the wall and be looking at nothing. And I was like, well, that's really interesting. Like, let's keep an eye on it. And then, um, and then at the same time, I'm thinking about like, why is the dog having so much trouble eating? And it was like, there was no pattern to like what was working and what wasn't. And I'm like, this, it was really feeling like it wasn't a behavioral issue. Mm, And then in preparing for this episode, I came across an article about a dog who was stargazing. And it turned out that that dog had chronic vomiting and would, and had developed esophageal sores. So sores in the pipe that goes from your mouth to your stomach. And so the dog was like arching up and looking up, which straightens out that tube, which probably alleviates some pressure or pain. And so that's, so once they figured that out, they could treat the dog for the uh, sores in the esophagus and then the behavior went away. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. So we're still what a a road, (laughs) what a road to get there. (laughs) Yeah. But you really have to look for that specific thing, you know, in order, in order to know. And it was really interesting, like the the synchrony that just developed out of this case, how like we were doing this psychosis episode (laughs) and I have this case right now. So I was like, Ooh, and like, I, I used the CBARC, the canine behavior and research questionnaire, which had that specific question that I needed That's to so know interesting. for that dog. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing what the vet says about the esophagus. I hope that she's going to get all better. Yeah. Um, and that there's no more pain because that sounds horrible. Yeah, <laughs> for the poor horrible dog. for everyone involved, like the, the yeah. humans and the dog. So and- stressful. Yeah, but it's actually great that that behavioral um, questionnaire or it's a behavioral questionnaire. Yeah. I I think that's awesome that they included something that is a psycho a psychosis uh, yeah. or psychotic symptom. So absolutely, mm-hmm. it is important, of course, to look at these behaviors no matter what the source is, right? Mm-hmm. And exactly. to maybe even understand the differences between them. Right. And this is why we've been doing this podcast. Like, what could it be? What is these underlying causes? Also, what is this a symptom of, you know, it can be a symptom of several different things or of like a specific thing. So that's really cool though. I'm so glad you were able to help. Mm -hmm. Um, it sounds like it'll clear up now. Yeah, I hope so. I'm hopeful. (laughs) So I'm noticing the time and I have therapy today. So I feel like I'm wondering if you feel cool with shifting into our aftercare tips. So Absolutely. I, I felt ready that. too. So there you go. <laughs> cool. Talk about synchronicity. <laughs> awesome. So for today's aftercare tip, I want to give us a little guidance on practicing gratitude. We've probably heard about gratitude practices and how good that can be for your mental health. And I want to remind us of that, but I also want to tell you like the way I've developed a relationship with gratitude over the past couple of years has been as thinking about gratitude as medicine, like something that can help us feel better and help us heal. And, um, and a lot of my current gratitude practice is inspired by indigenous wisdom. Um, one of my favorite books is Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass. And uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer is a member of the Potawatomi Nation. And she also talks about um, the Iroquois Six Nations Confederacy and how they have a really like their culture is really rooted in gratitude especially Mm -hmm. practicing gratitude within relationships with yourself and with others especially the more than human worlds Um, so thank you to Robin Wall Kimmerer for writing that book and sharing it with us Um, but in terms of gratitude as medicine I think of gratitude as like an antidote like almost like a tincture that you could take if you had like a poison, uh, if a poisonous snake bit you, right? And you need an antidote to stop the poison. So the poison that I'm thinking about is shame. When you've like, think you've done something wrong or you have hurt somebody and you just become flooded with shame. And it's, it's a horrible feeling. It feels so uncomfortable. It feels really scary too, because 
because uh, a lot of us have been raised um, in a punitive culture where you do something wrong, you get punished for it. And so it can be really scary to, to acknowledge that you made a mistake um, or to see that you have hurt somebody. And shame is really paralyzing. It's hard to do anything else except feel that shame. And a lot of times we want to escape from it um, because we don't know what to do. But um, so I've been learning about how gratitude can be an antidote to shame. And so the, what that means is that when you're feeling shame, if you can find something to be grateful for, um, even if you're not feeling grateful, if you can find something to start saying thank you for, then especially if you can find a way to be thankful for yourself, maybe thankful that I realize I did something wrong or thankful that I can see the impact of my actions on somebody else. Um, that can help alleviate the shame and help you to not be paralyzed by it. And then this also extends to our dogs, um, both in terms of moving through shame, but also in alleviating stress for our dogs, because our dogs will, will often say no to the things that we ask them to do, or sometimes they even growl at us and set a more firm boundary, and that can be really hard to receive. Um, and it can, we can feel shame, like, oh my gosh, I've done something that made my dog upset and, and that feels bad and feels really uncomfortable. So I've in, extended my gratitude practice to Muggins by saying thank you to Muggins every time they say no to me. And, and, it, and it can be something where I'm like, hey, will you let me, um, maybe they're like shaking their ear and scratching their ear. And I'm like, hey, will you let me look at your ear? And I feel like this urgency, like I want to look at that ear and make sure it's okay. Um, and then Muggins will say no. And I have to take a step back and take a beat and go like, okay, thank you for telling me that you're not ready for this. Thank you for pointing out that maybe I'm feeling too much urgency to move through this at a pace that's comfortable for you. Um, and to just like settle into that, like, okay, thank you for telling me I needed that information. Now I can make a change and, and move forward. So I want to take us through a little bit of a relaxing gratitude practice as we move out of this podcast. So go ahead and get comfortable in your seat, however that feels for you, or maybe you're laying down in bed, um, or you're driving in your car. And we're just going to start to take a few deep breaths. If you'd like to close your eyes, you can. Um, I'm going to close mine. And I'm going to put one hand on my heart and one hand on my belly. And just breathe in slowly through your nose. And out through your mouth. And we're just going to start by thanking ourselves. Thank yourself for being here. Thank yourself for taking the time to learn something. Thank yourself for taking the time to practice gratitude. Thank your body for being here. Thank your body for waking up today. Thank your body for feeling the way that it feels and using sensation to talk to you and tell you what you need. And if you're having trouble finding gratitude, just going through the motions and saying the words can start to shift your body into a place where gratitude might be possible.
Thank your lungs for breathing. Thank your heart for beating. Thank your stomach for gurgling and telling you when you need to eat. Go ahead and take one more deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. And when you feel ready, go ahead and wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes, and open your eyes. I was very, uh, I feel very at peace. I could just hear Duchess snoring and it made me feel grateful for her. Mm, thank you, Duchess. <laughs> I find it comforting, her snoring. <laughs> yeah, that is super comforting. That was, you know, I really, I think we should do an afterthought on this topic, to be honest, because I think we can talk a lot about it. Yeah. But to just wrap up, uh, there's two things I'd like to share. One, we obviously hear the word gratefulness a lot in modern day, kind of like thrown around and in a good way, but also I think it can be difficult to anchor on to what that really means. Yeah. And I really appreciate that you like brought a way for us to um, be solid in practicing it because I think like it can feel overwhelming when you're just like be grateful or think of gratefulness or mm -hmm. um the second piece I also want to say to people out there listening who may have trouble practicing gratitude or getting started as someone who um, struggles with depression like I really struggle with gratefulness a lot especially when I feel depressed um or am in depression <laughs> Thank you, Duchess, for alerting me that someone's home. <laughs> See, I did it right there. <laughs> um, but what has gotten, what has been a breakthrough for me in those moments is to just start listing off like simple things that I'm grateful for yeah. and external things like I'm thankful for the sun. I'm thankful for the tree because I wouldn't be able to breathe without it. Yeah. things like that. Like once yeah. you start rolling, it'll, it rolls, you mm -hmm. know? Um, yeah. and I definitely felt that in this exercise with you, Sharon, as well. Like right. once you get it rolling. <laughs> yeah. Like, like so thank ball. you. You're welcome. And thank you. All right. So that wraps up our season one. Stay tuned for season two. Be sure to follow us on Instagram for updates. Um, and check out our subscription on Spotify for all the care tips and afterthoughts. Yeah. And thank you to everyone who's been listening to all of our episodes. Um, we're so happy to have you here and following along. Yeah. And we'll see you soon. All right. Bye. Even though we are licensed professionals in our own field of work, Angela, LCSW, Sharon, OTD, and CDBC, this podcast is not intended to replace individual therapy for humans or behavior support for dogs. We approach our conversations from an exploratory, observational, and strictly personal lens. If you are struggling with your mental health, your dog's behavior, or if you or your dog have experienced a recent traumatic event, please see the resources section on our websites for a list of resources and places that can help. Visit either www.hc-collab.com slash happy dog, happy human, or www.clouddoodles.com slash happy dog, happy human. For additional show notes, including books and articles that we mentioned, please check out the footnotes section on our websites.
Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support the show, go to buymeacoffee.com slash HDHH podcast and send us a few bucks so that we can stay awake and energized to make more content. This podcast is made possible by the collaboration between Cloud Doodles and Human Canine Collaborative. Check out our websites at www.clouddoodles.com or www.hc-collab.com. Special thanks to Tom Fox at Tom Fox Photos for support with editing and production consulting. You can find Tom at tomfoxphotos.com. Also special, special thanks to sound effects and story examples from Duchess and Muggins. We could not and would not ever want to do this without you.